So good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Allison Perkins, Executive Director at Ronalda House, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you. Um, so although Still I Rise, the Black Experience at Ronalda exhibition does not open until 2022, we were very much inspired by the Bookmarks Book with Purpose initiative that we designed this preview. So if you aren't familiar with Books with Purpose, I'll just briefly explain that it's a community-wide anti-racism initiative grounded in American literature and shared dialogue. And I wanna give a special thanks to Bookmark for making this education, educational um, partnership a reality for our community. So it gives me great pleasure and an honor to introduce today's presenter, Barry Helms. Barry is Director of Archives and the Library at Rinalda. She earned her BA in History from Duke University and a Master's in Library and Information Science from UNC Chapel Hill. So prior to her 2014 arrival at Rinalda, she was a local records archivist at the Library of Virginia in Richmond. And at Rinalda, Barry has helped develop the Rinalda Revealed app, which I hope many of you have downloaded. And she's curated exhibitions, including Catherine Smith Reynolds Johnston, A Self in the Remaking. I really like that um, uh, a very popular archival exhibition, Still I Rise, A Black Experience at Rinalda, is grounded in primary resources, including correspondence and oral histories. More than Rinalda as a private family home, today's talk will explore the site's history as an American art museum. And one chapter in the museum's history that I'm particularly interested in learning more about is the contributions of visiting artists to the museum. So without further ado, I bring you Barry Helms. Barry, thanks so much for your um, many contributions to Rinalda and for the research that you're embarking on for this really special exhibition. And thanks again to Bookmarks and everyone in our audience for joining us. Barry, thank you. Thank you, Allison, and thank you everyone for joining me today for a preview of the next archival exhibit. Um, Still I Rise, the Black Experience will open next year and it will examine the many ways that Black men and women have intersected with Rinalda from the tobacco plantation where RJ Reynolds grew up through Rinalda as a working estate and family home during the Jim Crow era, through the civil rights era until Rinalda became a public institution dedicated to the arts. Um, that is a vast story to parse down for a preview talk today. Um, I struggle with how to organize this so that you're getting um, as close to a full experience of the exhibit as possible. Um, I decided to approach this from the perspective of the museum era. And so today I'm going to talk about the events and programs that were happening that shaped the evolution of the museum and what projects were happening that helped us know what we know about Rinalda's past. Um, I created a timeline of the events and projects that inform this exhibit and particularly this talk today. And so we're going to be talking about what was happening at the museum, particularly in the 70s and 80s. And we will sort of hop from topic to topic. So it'll be a little bit of a bumpy ride, but just stick with it. Um, so this way you're going to get the highlights of some of these significant moments in the exhibition. So Ronaldo opened to the public as an institution dedicated to the arts and education in 1965, and then as an art museum in 1967, but I'm gonna to start today in 1970. So 1970 was the year that the museum named its first executive director, Nicholas B. Bragg. He had been at Old Salem, and he was hired to really start the education program at Rinalda. And that education program was what Rinalda was known for for a number of years, even when um, Rinalda first got accredited by the American Association of Museums in 1972. They noted that um, Rinalda didn't really operate like a traditional museum at the time, but they had an incredibly strong educational program in place. But why I want to talk about 1970 is the opening of the Reynolds Homestead in Kreitz, Virginia. That, that seems like an Barry, 
Yes. Barry, this is Amber Albert. Sorry to interrupt. Uh -huh. um, we've had quite a few people um, have trouble with the link. It is going to the calendar instead of the uh, webinar. So I have resent uh, the link to everyone and just okay. want to see, um, give it just a couple minutes for folks to catch up. Okay. If, if, you, if you're comfortable doing that. Sure. Yes, see, we, we've already sort of doubled our attendance. So just maybe two more minutes. Sure. And I, I apologize, everyone. I'm not sure how that transpired. Okay. I'll just back this up a little bit. I will go ahead and um, restart a little bit for folks who are just now joining us. Um, so today to preview this exhibition, Still I Rise, I'm going to focus in on events and programs that um, informed how the museum evolved and also the projects that were happening that helped us learn what we know about Ronalda's past. So Ronalda opened as a institution, opened it to the public as an institution dedicated to the arts and education in 1965, and then as, as an art museum in 1967, but I'm going to start today in 1970. Uh, 1970 was the year that the museum named its first executive director, Nicholas B. Bragg. Um, he had been at Old Salem, and he was hired to really start the education program at Ronalda, and um, Ronaldo was known for a number of years for the strength of its educational programming. Um, but what happened in 1970 that I really want to talk about is um, the opening of the Reynolds Homestead in Kreitz, Virginia, which seems like a strange place to start. Um, but the Reynolds Homestead was actually Rock Spring Plantation where RJ was born and where he grew up. It had stayed in family hands and then Nancy Reynolds, RJ and Catherine's younger daughter acquired it and she was like, what do I do with this now? Um, she ended up deeding the house and surrounding acres to Virginia Tech and it was and still is used as a community engagement center and a forestry research center. Um, where it connects to Ronalda is that um, Nancy had developed a relationship with Nick Bragg through Ronalda and she turned to him for advice in turning the property into a museum. And for a few years, Ronalda staff actually ran the educational programs at the Reynolds Homestead. But what's relevant to this exhibition is that while they were renovating the home, they found a box of documents that had belonged to RJ's father, Hardin William Reynolds. Um, this box is still on display at the museum and you can, it's not a great picture, but um, you can see in the box, there's this fabric um, filing system that he used to organize his papers, but all the documents actually came to Ronalda and are in our archives today. And those papers really helped fill out RJ's history and the truth of what his background and early years were really like. So during his lifetime, R.J. Reynolds really relied heavily himself on this myth that he was a self-made man who came from almost nothing to become this industrial titan in tobacco. And his legacy today sometimes still depends on that myth-making. Um, even the choice to name the museum at Kreitz, the Reynolds Homestead, instead of what it was known during R.J.'s time, which was Rock Spring Plantation, as to that idea that RJ came from humble beginnings. It's just really interesting that even in 1970, they knew that the term homestead had different connotations than plantation. Unlike other farmers in the region, RJ's father recognized that manufacturing tobacco was more lucrative than growing the leaf alone. By the time RJ was born in 1850, the tobacco factory was Hardin's primary source of income. RJ grew up as a boy and young man working the floor of his father's tobacco factory. He learned the mechanics of the factory, the value of one flavoring over another, the factors that led to the fluctuations of tobacco prices, and how to select the choicest leaf. In later life, RJ would use the story of working as a hand in his father's factory to ingratiate himself with his own workers. And while that story was technically true, he did so as the slaveholder's son. So Hardin Reynolds was one of the largest slaveholders in his area of Virginia. 
By the time of the Civil War, he owned more than 60 enslaved persons. Um, I mentioned that the Reynolds Homestead is still operating as a museum, and in recent years, they have done tremendous research in um, documenting the history of enslaved people on the property and documenting the um, enslaved graveyard that is, that is still there. Uh, but as part of Hardin's papers that came to Ronalda, there are several bills of sale for enslaved people. The example I have up here today on the left um, is one for the hiring out of a man named Frank for the year 1860. Um, Hardin's tobacco plantation survived the Civil War and transitioned to using Black tenant labor or sharecroppers. Hardin paid very little. He drew up harsh contracts and would often not fulfill his agreement. In one instance during Reconstruction, the Freedmen's Bureau stepped in to advocate on behalf of a woman who claimed that Hardin did not pay her and also threatened to drive her from the property. And there are other instances in the late 1860s where tenant farmers were suing Hardin to receive what they or their families were owed for their work. So RJ grew up in the slave holding economy and later sharecropping. And it's interesting to think about how that influenced how RJ treated his own workers. We certainly see the idea of fraternalism play out and how RJ consistently gave small amounts of money to social institutions, reform associations, hospitals, schools, and churches, particularly those in the black community. His strategy certainly suggests that he understood how industries could function as social institutions. RJ's giving was local and piecemeal, but it proved to be a strategic way to foster a social stability that would help stabilize his workforce and prevent workers from heading north to find better paying jobs. And his strategy worked. We don't see a serious attempt by tobacco workers to, to unionize until 1919, which was the year after RJ's death. All right, so we're going to switch gears a little and skip to 1972 and 1973. In 1972 is when Ronaldo received its first accreditation from the American Association of Museums. There was a Black art seminar and, and exhibit. In 1973, Ronaldo received its first painting by a Black artist, and Maya Angelou made her first of many visits to Ronaldo. So in 1972, then executive director Nicholas Bragg received a phone call from a museum goer asking how Ronaldo could presume to present American art when there were no black artists represented in the collection. So out of that conversation came a seminar on black art and, and an exhibition of paintings. So at the seminar, participants discussed the challenges of being black and an artist, how that affected their work, the struggle to make a living as an artist, and they even grappled with, you know, what was Black art? How did they define that? Um, this was the first of several instances where Black artists came together at Ronalda to discuss their work. Even 10 years from this point, we will see the same topics being discussed by artists. Um, how does being Black affect your art? There's this constant theme of the pressures they felt to represent in a community and to have their art speak not only for themselves, but for the Black community as a whole. Here, um, muralist Eugene Wade said, I no longer attempt to represent all Black artists. I'm doing what is significant to me. So Nick Bragg gave an interview about the Black art seminar. And at the end of the, end of the interview, he spoke about being excited that the event prompted the first gift of a work by a Black artist to be added to Ronaldo's permanent collection. In the interview, he actually named Jacob Lawrence's Builders Number no. Two as the work that was coming to Ronalda, um, but it would actually be a few years before that piece um, was added to the collection. Horace Pippin's 1941 work, The Whipping, was actually the first acquisition by an African American artist, and it is still the earliest work in the collection by a Black artist. Um, it was a gift to the museum by Lee Alt, a major figure in the New York art world. Um, he gave the painting to the museum after Barbara Babcock Millhouse, the museum's um, first president, had admired the painting in his apartment. So the whipping is a small piece that addresses racial injustice in 19th and 20, 20th century America. Horace Pippin served during World War I and sustained an injury to his right shoulder that forced him to invent new ways to create his art. After his return from war, Pippin felt betrayed by the racial injustices and inequalities he experienced. Uh, the red, white, and blue color palette of this work combined with an image from the days of slavery suggests that 
It is Pippin's commentary about the horrific aspects of America's past and how it was still resonating for him in his own time. Um, in 19, later in 1973 was the year when Maya Angelou first came to Ronalda and Wake Forest. She performed her, her work in the reception hall and she spoke to a standing room only crowd at Wake Forest during the school's first Black Awareness Week. Much of her presentation concerned what it meant to grow up in the South as a human being with black skin and what African-Americans, including students, still had to endure. Her talk went well into the night as she continued to engage with students long after her formal presentation was over. Um, later, she wrote about the experience in Ebony Magazine and she wrote, I had pulled no punches and softened no points, yet whites stood beside blacks, clapping their hands and smiling. I knew that morning that one day I would return to the South in general and North Carolina in particular. Um, she returned to Wake Forest in 1977 to receive an honorary degree, and in 1982, she was named the first Reynolds Professor of American Studies, and she made her home in Winston-Salem on land that was once part of the Rinalda estate. So we're going to jump ahead in 1980 and a project that was instrumental in our understanding of Ronaldo's history, particularly in our knowledge of the lives of the men and women who lived and worked on the estate. Um, so the Ronaldo Oral History Project was, it was actually partially funded by R.J. Reynolds Industries, as it was known then. Um, the project was led by Luann Jones, a graduate student at, in the Southern Oral History Program at UNC. Luann noted at the time that most of the Reynolds family was interpreted through the story of Z. Smith Reynolds' death and that there was a lot of misstatement of fact. And in fact, one of several books written about Libby Holman was actually published months before Luann started conducting her interviews. She thought that people seemed to think that the key to unlocking the history of the Reynolds family was the Smith story, but she didn't think that was the case. She was much more interested in Catherine Reynolds. So while I'm going to focus on what this project learned about the Black community today, these interviews also help shape how we understand Catherine Reynolds as well. In talking about the project, Luann Jones said, mainly we were trying to get at what life was like at Ronaldo for the many people whose lives intersected there, from the woman who was laundress to the woman who was served breakfast in bed. We wanted to look at Ronaldo from different points of view. So as the project progressed, the priorities of it actually shifted a little, little because it became clear to them that the interviews could add a significant contribution to the understanding of the history of African Americans in Winston-Salem. Um, the interviews detailed experiences at Ronaldo, but they also dwell on what it meant to be Black in the Jim Crow South. Um, the picture um, you see up on your screen right now is Luann Jones interviewing Harvey Miller, who um, he grew up in, I'll talk more about him in a minute, but he grew up in Five Row and became the butler for the Babcock family. And he continued to be employed by Ronaldo when it was turned into a museum. Um, you, she's interviewing him here on the sun porch and you can tell it was a different time because you could sit on the furniture then. So it was through this oral history project that the story of the lives of the black men and women who worked here really come to life, particularly the story of Five Row. Five Row doesn't appear in the written documents in the archives at all. Um, it's shown on the map of the estate that was done in 1924 and corrected in 1927, which you see on your screen right now. But it's not labeled as Five Row. It's identified as colored cottages with no information about the people who lived there and the lives they led. Um, their names do appear on the payroll ledgers, but without this oral history project, the idea that Five Row became a community of shared experiences and not just a cluster of cottages would have been lost to history. Um, so Five Row gets its name because it originally consisted of two rows of five houses with a larger boarding house for multiple families and a two-room building that served as a school and church. And it's through this project that we begin to understand how Ronaldo worked as an estate during the time of Jim Crow. Um, Jim Crow laws touched every aspect of life from jobs to education to health care. Um, you know, in, in practice, Jim Crow was really the legitimization of anti-Black racism, and Ronaldo was not ex exempt from that. Um, it's really impossible to talk about Ronaldo's history without the context of Jim Crow, particularly what was happening in Winston-Salem at the time. 
Um, Large-scale disenfranchisement began happening in the 1892 and 1894 elections. Um, this followed the 1890 election in which the newly formed colored man's ticket defeated all of the white Democrats, which interestingly included R.J. Reynolds, who was up for re-election as city commissioner that year. Then in 1912, Winston-Salem enacted a residential segregation ordinance modeled after the one in Richmond. And 1912 is the same year that construction begins at Ronalda. So Ronalda was technically outside of Winston-Salem city limits and therefore not subject to municipal laws, but that didn't mean that Ronalda was exempt from Jim Crow. There may not have been a law in place to force segregation at Ronalda, but Jim Crow created such a pervasive racialized culture that it affected all spaces and places. Um, we see evidence of this at Ronaldo through separate housing, separate schools, and one good example is how Five Row was created as a separate, not always equal community. Um, for the oral history project, Luann Jones said she wanted to learn about the laundress to the woman who served breakfast in bed. Um, Flora Pledger was one of the women who at times worked in the laundry at Ronaldo. Through her interview, we learned that Ronalda did pay good wages, better than what farm workers and tenant farmers could earn elsewhere. Ellis Pledger, her husband, traveled 20 miles a day to make $9 a week, and that was three times the pay he had been, he had been earning. In 1916, he moved to Five Row with Flora, who described their new home as the best place I'd ever seen. Um, Catherine Reynolds increased wages for regularity and she gave generous Christmas bonus bonuses that in some years included cash. Um, for the average farm worker wages began at $7.50 a week and then went up to $18 a week by 1940. Um, early jobs for black farm workers included draining ditches and the construction of Lake Catherine. This involved the stones to be used for the lake bridge and walls. The overflow on the Ronaldo Road side of the lake became the community pool used by black and white workers. And according to several oral histories, this space was also used for baptism by the Five Row Church. Um, other early jobs for black workers were clearing the land and laying the foundations for the first buildings. You can catch a few workers in this picture putting up the superintendent's cottage. Um, after construction was completed, black workers tended to livestock, planted and harvested crops, and generally helped maintain the property. Workers received their job for the day and their pay at the watering shed, which was located in, centrally in the village. Uh, many of them worked as teamsters, working with a mule or horse uh, team pulling a plow. They also drove, drove mule teams to clear roads and spaces to build and improve on the estate. Um, and this work of grading the land with mule teams actually continued on into the 30s. The indoor pool at Ronaldo was an addition added by the Babcock family in 1935, 1936. And we have photographs of men working that area with a, with a mule team while the pool was under construction. Um, in addition to driving a team, workers would upkeep the roads, do landscaping, mow the grass, and on Saturdays, all men swept and raked around the lake. Um, workers' jobs included hauling coal to the heating plant, the rock quarry, and the blacksmith shop, and other miscellaneous jobs included driving the bus to transport workers and the night watchman. So unlike houses in Ronaldo Village, those in Five Row did not have electricity or running water. The houses were of board construction, while most of the residences in the village were made from stucco. Families made do with kerosene lamps and coal heaters. Water was drawn from several taps of artesian well water. If you were lucky, you lived close enough to the water tap for the hose to reach your house. Um, residents raised their own livestock, poultry, hogs, and milk cows, and Ronaldo Farm provided milk and vegetables at wholesale prices. We don't have many pictures of Five Row, but you can get a glimpse of some of the houses in the background, like um, the photographs you, you see right now. Um, so on, on one hand, this way of living would have been viewed as normal for farm workers living in the country. However, it becomes unequal when you look at the context of Catherine getting what is now Renata Road paved, one of the first ones in the state. She worked with the electric company to get electricity all the way out here um, and could have provided it to Five Row, but chose not to. Uh, many of the oral history interviews talk about the school at Five Row. 
education was provided for the children of the families who worked at Ronalda. There was the Ronalda School for White Children that even the Reynolds children attended. Um, but there was a separate school at Fibro, and it was housed in this building that also served as a church. The school opened in 1918 with six students. Uh, classes were held in the two-room building that um, you see on your screen. They had the same curriculum as the Ronaldo School. History, geography, spelling, grammar, painting, drawing, music, and math were taught. One student um, recalled learning about aviation. Um, teachers at the Fiverr School were educated at Hampton University, Bennett College, and Slater Academy. Attendance continued to grow. Um, some Black families in town actually sent their children out to the Fiverr schools as they deemed it better um, than the public schools for Black children. The Ronaldo School closed in 1923, but the school at Fiverr actually operated another 20 years, closing sometime in the 1940s. We learn a lot about the domestic staff that worked in the house in these interviews as well. Um, as many of the people interviewed worked in the house for the Babcock family. Um, often when you think about domestic staff, you think of living staff, but that was rarely the case in the South during this time period. And at Ronalda, the only domestic staff members who lived in the house were the governess and nurses. Most of the domestic staff lived downtown and traveled from the city to Ronalda and back, taking a streetcar for a nickel to the downtown post office and then a bus that Catherine provided out to Ronalda. Um, and the bus is an interesting piece about from the oral history project that like even the oral history project didn't answer all of the questions when did it start how long did it last who could use it um did employees have to pay the fare was that part of their employment um i did discover recently that the fares for the teachers at the fiver school were paid for by Ronalda, but it's unclear if um, that was the case for the domestic staff as well um, so we saw early that picture of Luann Jones interviewing Har Harvey Miller. Um, his interview, all total, is about eight hours long. Um, Harvey Miller grew up in Five Row after his parents, Henry and Mamie Miller, came to Ronalda in 1922. His father worked on the farm and was one of the mule teamsters. Um, Harvey started out doing odd jobs in the estate and eventually trained under John Carter, who was Catherine's butler, to become the butler for the Babcocks. He would work here at Ronalda and would travel with the family when they were living in Connecticut. And then he would continue to work at Ronalda after it became a museum. And he um, retired in 1982. So Harvey is an example of multi-generational tenures that happened at Ronalda. And this was a bit unusual for the time period, particularly for people who were in domestic service. The typical time for most domestics to work at one place was three to six months. So having someone like Harvey who grew up here and then worked his entire career here was unusual. So when Harvey was interviewed, he talked a lot about his job and he said, I didn't work by the hour. You'd start and stop. You had a starting point, but not too much of a getting off point. I was here all the time. I'd come here in the morning at eight o'clock, 7.30 or eight, and would stay until everything was finished. Um, but Harvey made the point that being the employee of such an established and well-regarded Winston-Salem family actually softened race relations when dealing with other white people in Winston-Salem. Um, the specific, specific example he used was that white store owners were far more willing to extend him credit than to other black men because he was known to work for the Reynolds family. Elizabeth Wade was a, another staff member who um, was interviewed. She started off at the laundry and then worked as a maid and Catherine Reynolds was so impressed with her work um, that she had her take over the role of switchboard operator. Um, Elizabeth Wade actually quit Renata to raise her own family um, after she got married, but she later came back to work as a gover governess for Dick Reynolds, RJ and Catherine's oldest son. In her interview, um, Elizabeth Wade talks a lot about being white passing and what that meant for that time period. Um, she describes having to ride on a Jim Crow car, Jim Crow train car, and how awful and hot it was and um, when she changed trains, she decided to pass and ride the rest of the way on the white car. She also shared how she was asked to pass by Dick Reynolds while she was working for him, that when they 
traveled they would go to places that she couldn't as a black woman even though she was with the kids like um the example she gave like was on the plane or when they were at the beach in Miami and Dick Reynolds would tell her and this was, this was her quote you're not black now you're white so Elizabeth Wade didn't get into how this made her feel this having to deny a piece of your identity but it clearly made an impact that she was talking about it you know two decades after it happened. So when um, these former staff members were interviewed, they were all asked about the civil rights movement and particularly how the Babcock family felt about the civil rights era. With Harvey in particular, that was an interesting question to ask because he was someone who was still employed at Rinalda. He was working for the museum and I'm sure there was a sense that the Reynolds family was still kind of his boss. I mean, he, me, his interview even took place at Rinalda. No one answered the question directly, which isn't surpri surprising. They all sort of deflected and answered around it. Um, but Harvey answered the question by saying uh, she, meaning Mary uh, Reynolds Babcock, didn't say my servants. It was her staff. They didn't tell you to do so and so. They asked you and said thank you. They had respect for us and we had respect for them. I'll put it that way. So in his interview, he returns a lot to this idea of mutual respect. And another quote, he said, I won't say it was love, but it was respect. And you hear echoes of that sentiment in many of the other interviews as well. So around 1960, and you can see Fyro in this image, um, it's the cluster of houses in the upper left corner. So Fyro lasted until around 1960 when it was demolished for the building of Silas Creek Parkway during a push for urban renewal. Um, it was a time in which various levels of white majority governments um, raised traditionally black neighborhoods and replaced them with new roads and highways beneath a veneer of progress. Um, some current residents, the five row chose to purchase their home and use the materials to help build their new houses. In her interview, Flora Pledger talked about successfully petitioning Charlie Babcock to pay for the relocation of the church building. So while the Renata Oral History Project gave us the stories of the people of five row, uh, many of whom actually lived here longer and were a more constant presence at Ronaldo than members of the Reynolds family. Um, but it would be more than a decade later before we could add faces to many of these names and stories. Um, Gigi Parent, who's pictured here on the left, um, went gathering stories and photographs in the community, she, with the help of Saki Hamlin, to flesh out the story of the five row community. And she curated an exhibit um, called The Spirit of Ronaldo: Black Contributions to Ronaldo 1912 to 1962. Um, it opened in 1993. So she went to the community to talk to former five row res residents who were still alive or their descendants. Uh, she learned more names, she gathered more stories, and you know, most importantly, she collected this visual evidence. Um, she talks about going and asking these families for photographs and, and at first they would give her pictures of the Reynolds family and she would be like, no, no, I want pictures of you. And so many of them told her that that was the first time anyone had asked them for that. Um, when the exhibit opened at Ronalda, it was um, displayed on the sun porch. It was the largest opening for an exhibit at that time. And it really spoke to how vibrant the five row community still was and how important it was to continue to tell these stories. All right, so we're gonna um, shift back to the art world in 1981. So in March 1981, a contemporary American art seminar combined the talents of artist Jacob Lawrence, author and poet Maya Angelou, and musicians Antoinette Handy and William E. Terry. The seminar marked the opening of a month-long exhibition of paintings by Lawrence, whose Builders Number no. 2 was on permanent loan to Ronaldo House. Um, nine other paintings, including six from Lawrence's private collection, provided a sampling of Lawrence's development from 1942 to 1979. Um, Lawrence is pictured here in front of some of his works on display. Um, beside him is his wife, Gwendolyn Knight, an artist in her own right, who he credits as his third eye, giving him an objective opinion of his work. 
So the three-day seminar featured a reading of the Ronalda House Collection by Jacob Lawrence, a lecture of his work in two separate studio sessions, one for local artists and one for the general public. Um, there was a lecture and demonstration on the history of jazz and an evening with Maya Angelou. At, at this point in her career, she had published three collections of poetry and three volumes of her autobiography. She would actually come back to Renato later um, the same year for a reading of the fourth volume, Heart of a Woman. Um, as part of the seminar, Maya Angelou and Jacob Lawrence shared a public conversation between artists. Um, they knew each other prior and speaking of the event, Jacob Lawrence said, I don't know what form that will take. When you're dealing with a person who deals with words, you don't do the same things. My medium is a visual one, but knowing her, I know the conversation won't be dull. Um, like with the Black Art Seminar nearly a decade earlier, they spoke of the challenges of being Black in America, what it meant to be a Black artist, and the power of protest. Uh, Lawrence spoke about Black artists feeling an obligation to the Black community, and he said, if they are sensitive to this, then their expression moves out beyond the Black consciousness and benefits everybody. Angelo summed it, summed it up by saying, start at home and spread it abroad. They both spoke about the pressures they felt as artists to have their art speak for the Black community. Jacob Lawrence worried that some of the scenes and imagery he used in his work would speak to the Black community, but could be read as stereotypes outside of it. Um, Maya Angelou sort of expounded on that to say that, um, I am sometimes criticized for writing a poem about a leaf when the whole forest is on fire. Sometimes I say to hell with it and go on, but she said she often sees young people on a one-way train to nowhere, and that she can't ignore the responsibility she feels to let her art speak for them. She said, if things were different in this yet to be United States, I would be free to talk about a sunrise without saying that it is rising on a noose, hanging high and casting a shadow on the land. Um, she ended on a more positive note when she spoke of her production of A Raisin, a Raisin in the Sun. And she said, we have changed in 20 years. We have risked more. We now see the black man and black woman as human beings in process. We are all in process. So these um, artist conversations really just continued into 1982 when Romare Bearden came to Ronalda. Um, he came in October of 1982 and Ronalda featured an exhibit of paintings by Bearden. Um, he pleased standing room only audiences with anecdotes about the Harlem Renaissance and his years in Paris. He was unpretentious about his success and penetrating in his insights about art. The French have a saying, he said, if you feel life, it's a tragedy. If you think about it, it's comedy. The art of painting has no place for tears. Um, like the visit by Lawrence, this program with Bearden also featured a conversation with Maya Angelou. And unlike with the talk with Lawrence, this one was recorded. So we have this artifact, of the event that lives on. Um, the video quality is terrible, but you know we still have their words. Um, they talk about how their art speaks to the human condition, that they deal with the complexities of life, not just the Black experience. Um, I'm going to see if I can share this video. Hopefully, it will work. Hopefully y'all can hear this. Right, so I'm hearing that we're not. All right. 
So I'm hearing we're not able to hear this and my volume is turned all the way up. So I'm gonna. Barry, uh, when you I'm, hit share screen, did you mm -hmm. enable audio? Oh, I see that now. Okay, so you might try, try that or time. you can just summarize for us, whatever most convenient. Let's try this one more time. I'm gonna rewind it just a bit. I know. All right. And New York, Pittsburgh, of course, all the black communities. And I don't mind at all being called a black artist. If when Pearlstein and some of the others that you would call them leading white artists, and since you do not make that discrimination, just call me an American artist. Well, <clears throat> I write through the black experience again, because that's what I know. And I believe it is better for any artist to uh, use the materials with which he or she is most familiar. I'm always talking about the human condition, what it is like to be a human being what makes us weep, what makes us laugh, what does us, how we sometimes make it over. Um, I too feel, if I'm described as a black artist, I am black and I am a poet. Um, if I'm described as a woman artist, I am a woman and I am a, a writer. Um, it, those two phrases, however, do not completely contain me. I am other than a black woman artist. I am an American, I'm a human being, I'm a mother, I'm somebody's lover, I'm a good friend and a sister and a daughter and I'm tall and I mean, if one is going to say, why not Maya Angelou the tall writer? <laughs> So hopefully you could hear um, some of that, but um, they were both talking about how they felt being described as a black artist. And uh, Maya Angelou said that, you know, she was more than a black woman artist. Those two words couldn't contain her, but she went on to say that she still felt if she was part of any community, it was the black community. That's the community she felt most connected to. Um, they both talked about their experiences in Harlem and how freeing it was to create art in a Black community. Maya Angelou described first going to Harlem and she said, I, I couldn't believe there were that many Black people in the world. It was a kind of affirmation that it was all right to be Black. I dared a lot. It gave me the, the right to be bodacious and I brought it back to Winston-Salem. So I'm going to end here um, with an excerpt from Maya Angelou's poem, Still I Rise, published in 1978. And this was the inspiration for the exhibit title. Um, I hope to share more of these stories with you next year when the exhibit opening opens. And um, we can open this up to any questions now. Um, thanks for attending today. I see one question here um, from that says, can you describe more specifically where Five Row was located and explain its name? So Five Row was, was located, the best way I can describe it is it was located um, where Silas Creek Parkway is now leading into um, the university. Um, it was- Gary? Yes. We can, we can see your presenter notes yeah, I'll take deal, that off. But, um, yeah. I can, I'll just stop sharing because I'm done. Thank you. All right. Um, and Five Row, um, also, can you explain its name? So Five Row got its name because it was originally um, two rows of five houses. That's where the name came from, Five Row.
And Barry, can you talk a little bit about, I understand Renolda applied for a grant uh, not too long ago to have some of these resources digitized and sharpened like that video clip. Can you talk about what it would mean to Renolda to have that accomplished? Yeah, so we um, recently applied for a grant to have some of our audio visual material, including like the video I shared today, um, redone, digitized. A lot of them are on the original VHS tapes. Um, over the years, you know, they've been used. They haven't always been stored in the best um, capabilities, and they need to be professionally digitized so that we can share them um, through programs like this. Um, the Maya Angelou Romero Bearden one in particular was digitized a number of years ago, um, but we think now technologies have changed and they may be able to uh, clean the video quality up a little bit, um, improve the audio, um, maybe brighten it up so it doesn't look like they're in the witness protection program um, so that we can continue, continue to share these programs that happened in the past to current um, museum audience. Right, so we're getting a question of where did the five row church end up um it ended up I, I can't describe the area where it ended up and it did end up being completely covered and rebuilt to the point that it was not recognizable as the five row church and in recent years it's, it's been completely destroyed so it's not there any longer So do you have a list of the artists and art that will be part of the exhibit? Will there also be contemporary artists represented? So I haven't finalized the object list quite yet for the um, exhibition. There will be um, Romare Bearden in there for sure. Um, I'm not sure which one yet. And we just had a recent acquisition of a Bearden. Um, but it's primarily going to be um, an archival show. So most of the sources in there are going to be photographs 